All right, <clears throat> what we're going to get into, um, we spent all the stuff last week talking about Hitler and Hitler's rise to power, all right? And so what this PowerPoint does is it talks about all the things that Hitler did once he got power, all right? So this, you know, I kind of give you a timeline. I go from 1933, 34, you know, 35, 36, I get a little stuff that uh, happens each year all the way up to when World War II starts in um, 1939. So um, at the very end of the Hitler packet, um, uh, we read about Hitler becoming the chancellor. And the chancellor is just like the vice president. So when you're the vice president, you really don't have a whole lot of responsibility unless the president dies. And if the president dies, and you become the president. So in 1933, Hitler is going to become, and it's in January of 1933, Hitler is going to become the chancellor, the vice president of Germany. And now he's just got to sit and wait for Hindenburg to die. Hindenburg's an old, old man in poor health. And so Hitler knows he's going to die pretty soon. And then he'll be the president. He'll be the, the lead guy in, in charge. He gets appointed to this position, chancellor, because he forced a bunch of elections um, in 1930. 233 or, or 1931 and 32 he he the, he and the Nazi party kept forcing a bunch of elections and um and and, and so finally uh, to just calm everything down the government said you know okay we'll let you be chancellor all right now one of hitler's big plots right soon after becoming the chancellor is is he wants everybody in germany to think that germany's under attack from all these foreign influences, right? Especially Jews and communists. He wants the German people to be afraid of Jews and communists. So one of the things that Hitler does is he secretly has the Reichstag government building burnt. Now the Reichstag building is would be like the equivalent of our Capitol building. It's a big national monument where the Reichstag met and he has the building burnt, right? And of course, he blames it on Jews and communists and conveniently arrests a poor guy named Herschel Greenspan, I think was the guy's name. And, um, and, and, you know, blames him and they have fake evidence and all that stuff. And, but so, you know, Hitler says, Hey, we've, um, we've got all these enemies within Germany and we got to find them. So in order to find our enemies, he pushes for the adoption of a, a new law called the Enabling Act. And the Enabling Act is the act that's going to allow him to act like a dictator. It basically takes all the rights and freedoms away from the people and gives him the power of the dictator and the whole purpose of giving him dictatorial power is so he could find these internal enemies inside Germany of the German people, all right? That's how he sells the whole thing, all right? And so it's bad news. Now, later on that year, um, Hindenburg dies and he takes over and is the man and he combines the president with the chancellor. You know, there's not going to be a vice president. There's not going to be anybody underneath him. He's going to have sole power. And so he quickly realizes that um, by 1934 that he has a bunch of people within his organization, within the Nazi party, that he has to get rid of people that know too much about what he's done. So he basically, and you guys are going to read about this later on in the week, um, he, he basically has a purge, kind of like what Stalin did, where he's going to get rid of a bunch of people that he thinks are his key enemies that could trip them up. All right, and this is called, so his purge was called Night of the Long Nights, Knives. And the, the main person that he went after was the leader of the SA because the leader of the SA, this guy's name was Ernest Rome. Um, and Ernest Rome is, uh, you know, the only guy that really stands up to Hitler all through the years. And so Hitler doesn't like it. And so he says, okay, it's time to get rid of him. So what he does is, is he gathers up all the leaders of the SA, Ernest Rome and all the guys that are really close to him. <clears throat> and he tells them to meet him 
at this little town outside of Munich called Bad Weisse. And uh, so all the SA leaders go to Bad Weisse and they think they're having this meeting with Hitler, but in reality, it's just a way to get them all in one spot so he can arrest them all. All right. And, and he's going to kill a bunch of other people, people that have, have treated him bad, people that he perceives know too much, people that he thinks are unloyal. It's not just SA members. It's a lot of people. All right. But some important people, and you're going to read about this. I can give you six or eight other important people in the article. I'm going to make you guys read for them. All right. Ernest Strom is, is the lead leader of the SA. And um, he and Hitler, Ernest Rome helps Hitler rise up through the the Nazi party and, you know, and, and get to the point where he's where he's at. But Ernest Rome also stands up to him. All right. And you're going to read about that because the, the SA was a really revolutionary group and they wanted to overthrow the government for years while, you know, before the Nazis got power. All right. Some other people. All right, guy named Gustav von Kahr. All right, had we been able to watch the movie, you would have seen Ernest Röhm and Gustav von Kahr. They both had big roles in the movie. Um, Gustav von Kahr was a guy that double-crossed Hitler. He was the the prime minister of Bavaria, and he was the guy that double-crossed uh, Hitler the night of the beer hall putsch when they tried to overthrow the government, and, and why Hitler eventually had to go to jail. This is the guy that was the lead guy. All right, guy named Kurt von Schleicher was in the government uh, part of the, you know, he at one point, he would time, he was the chancellor before Hitler was. And Hitler didn't trust him, wanted him gone. And then uh, Gregor Strasser was the guy that took the leadership role of the Nazi party when Hitler was in jail. All right. And again, Hitler didn't like him because of that. So um, those are some important people that got killed. During the purge, there were, again, somewhere between 200 and 1,000 people that got put to death, all right? And so that's the beginning of Hitler really consolidating his power in 1934 was the Night of the Lone Knives. He got rid of anybody that he thought could mess him up. All right, so 1935, that's when Hitler is going to, one of the things he hated is he hated the Treaty of Versailles. And so that's when he's going to start trying to dismantle the Treaty of Versailles. That's when he's going to start going after the, the, the Treaty of Versailles. Now, one of the big things that the Treaty of Versailles said is Hitler was only, you know, the Germany was only allowed to have 100,000 people in their military. Well, Hitler went right against that and started drafting people into the military in 1935, and he went quickly well over a million people. So he started military conscription, which is a draft, where he forced people to serve in the military. All right. The next thing he does, and we're going to read an article about this later in the week, is he passes a series of laws. And this is the beginning. So this is 1935. This is the start of the beginning of him now. So he's breaking the Treaty of Versailles and making this big giant army. And now <clears throat> he's going to go after the Jews. And so he passes a serious set of laws called the Nuremberg Race Laws. All right. <clears throat> and in the Nuremberg Race Laws, he specifically defines what a Jew is. Like a full Jew was somebody that had three Jewish grandparents, all right? And then he had first-degree Jews, second-degree Jews, and all this other stuff, all these other rules. But the high point of the Nuremberg race laws is it stripped all Jews of their German citizenship. So they're no longer, you could have been born there, your grandparents born there, your great-great-grandparents born there, you could have lived there for hundreds of years, your family, if you were Jewish, you lost your citizenship. So you no longer have the same rights as other German people, all right? And then the outlawed marriage, right? So taking citizenship, outlawed marriage, and defining what a Jew is, is the, the crooks of the Nuremberg race laws. You're going to read about them later in the week, all right? Now, next, 1936, this is where he starts to really practice, to get ready for World War II, all right? And, and, um, and again, the first thing he does is he, he goes after up here, look at the top of the Treaty of Versailles, he starts going after the Treaty of Versailles again. And one, the next thing he does to break the, the, the rules of the Treaty of Versailles is he moved German military into the Rhineland. Remember, the Rhineland was that little area, I'm going to show it to you on a map here in a minute, it's that little area of Germany that's between the Rhine River and France, and that was supposed to be a no-no. According to the Treaty of Versailles, he was, 
Germany was never allowed to have any military there. Well, he said, I don't care about that. Now, his practice for World War, where he started to practice to see if his war tactics were good, was during the Spanish Civil War. All right? Down in Spain, they had a fascist guy that was just like Hitler was. All right? His name was Francisco Franco. And Francisco Franco was in battle with the, the king of Spain over trying to take over the country. And so Hitler, wanting to help his fascist brother, Francisco Franco, down in Spain, sends, sends troops down to support Francisco Franco um, in, in the, during the Spanish Civil War. All right. Now, this was Hitler's practice for World War II. This was his practice scrimmage. All right. So that's big. All right. And it was the first time that he used the the war, the type of attack that he's going to become known for, called the Blitzkrieg. And the Blitzkrieg is where they used tanks and airplanes. They attack simultaneously, and they just overwhelm their enemy. And it, it, it ended up being the tactic that really allowed Hitler to take over the whole western part of Europe. Right? Blitzkrieg just means lightning war. All right? And, and so by October of 1936, Franco's in power down in in Spain, so now Hitler has a fascist ally south, um, Benito Mussolini in Italy, and a fascist um, ally over in the west with um, <clears throat> Francisco Franco. All right, so 1937, um, he starts, he knows he's going to start a war, all right, and he has a meeting where he talks about how he's going to plan this war. Meeting is called the Hossback Conference. The reason it's called the Hossback Conference, it ironically, is the guy that, that took the notes during the meeting, his last name was Hossback, and his name was at the top of the, the memorandum, um, you know, uh, all, where all the notes that were taken, what everybody said. And this was one of the documents when, when World War II was over and they were trying to, you know, find out who was guilty of war crimes and all that, this document, something didn't get, the Nazis did a really good job of destroying everything else towards the end of the war, but this was one of the documents that lived. And so it's kind of ironic, in 1937, Hitler was talking about how he was going to win the war and the exact plan he was going to take. And we have an article, I don't know if we're going to read the article on that or not, but we might. All right, so now we start etching closer to World War II. All right, you know, we start because it starts in 1939. So that last year, um, Hitler, <clears throat> excuse me, Hitler is going to start taking power. He's going to start taking territory, taking stuff. And so the first thing that he does is he's going to annex, take over Austria. All right, now you got to understand, Hitler was born in Austria. He's actually, he was actually an Austrian citizen before he was a German citizen. Um, and so he pronounces, his, he announces what, what he calls Anschluss, which just is the German word for union with Austria. And, and basically his argument was, is Austrian people and German people are all German people. And, um, and they should all be under one rule because they all speak German, have the same culture, same kind of dress the same way, live the same way. And he thought that they should all be united together. Now, most Austrian people didn't want this, but when Hitler comes rolling in with tanks and all this heavy-duty military equipment, the Austrians were in no position because their their military got dismantled after World War I as well. So they were in no position to stop him. And so basically Hitler rolls into Vienna with a bunch of military and says, hey, we're all one country. And the Austrian people say, fine, because what, what are you going to do? Now, next... There's another group of German, German people, German-speaking people, that were under a, another rule, right? And these were people that lived in the country or in, the, in, in a region of Czechoslovakia called Sudetenland. And Sudetenland is this part of Czechoslovakia that is close by. Um, it, it's the part of Czechoslovakia that kind of butts up against Germany. It's called Sudetenland. And so Hitler basically said that it was unfair that you had German speaking people that were under the rule of Slavic um, Slavs that ran Czechoslovakia. So he rolled in there with his troops and uh, 
took over uh, Sudetenland. When he does this, the France and Great Britain say, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, this isn't happening." And so every, everybody was in, in 1938. Everybody was terrified that this invasion of Sudetenland was going to start the war, right? But they ended up having a meeting, right? This meeting between Hitler and the leaders of Great Britain and France was called the Munich Conference. And basically, Hitler bullied the the leader, uh, you know, the the the, um, the prime minister. Of, of Great Britain, right? His name was Neville Chamberlain. And at the Munich conference, Hitler just bullied Chamberlain. Now, so Chamberlain basically said, hey, it's okay, you can have Austria, <clears throat> you can have Sudetenland, but if you do anything else, it's gonna be war. And Hitler goes, hey, I don't want anything else. All I want is to unite all the German speaking people, honestly, under one rule. That's all I wanted. You know, Hitler lying to him. But he's trying to sell them that all he wants is just all the German people speaking to be united under one rule. Right? And so um hey, let me go ahead and show you some stuff. Okay, so again, here's Germany up here, and Germany's kind of right here, and Austria is over here. So so Hitler's gonna come down and take Austria first, and then he's gonna take okay, so he's gonna take country right here, Czechoslovakia, where this orange or sound or which color that is. One just looking reddish looking color here. That's Sudetenland. That's part of Czechoslovakia that had a lot of German speaking people in it. That, and so Hitler wants Sudetenland to be part of Germany and wants Austria to be part of Germany. And one of the ways he's going to keep the Treaty of Versailles is he's going to put troops in this area, plus that in France, and that's Belgium, and that's the Netherlands. He's going, to, he's going to put troops in this Spangland, and he's not supposed to do that. Okay, so there you're kind of getting an idea of his, his expansion and ways that he's one thing he is supposed to do. And nobody calls him out on it. Okay, and if, think about it. In 1930, um, whatever, five or six, when Hitler put troops in Rhineland, what if Great Britain and France were declared war on him again? And he's not looking in 1935 or 1936 before he can take a power here. They don't. They don't do anything. And then by 1939, He's got a big, giant, powerful military, more powerful than everybody else's. And so it's too late then to do anything. All right, so let's go back to the Munich Conference. So what happens at the Munich Conference, right? The Alpha Munich Conference. First of all, Hitler knows that the Allies, you know, Great Britain and France, are afraid of him, and he can do whatever he wants. They, they, they basically get in. And so um, basically, the British Prime Minister, his name was Neville Chamberlain. He returns to Great Britain, claiming that he's a hero because he avoided war. He had this famous quote. It was called, we have achieved peace in our time. Peace in our time. We, 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 we've avoided war. You know, we're not going to go back to World War One again. We're going to, Hitler's on us with this. You know, he's coming back and saying all these things. And there was a guy in Great Britain that said, he isn't being honest. He's gonna do. He's gonna do more. And this guy's name was Winston Churchill. And this guy's name ends up being becoming the prime minister after they get rid of Chamberlain, right? And Winston Churchill basically has this famous quote down here. Right? This quote's hugely important, right? And, and this was what he said after Chamberlain said, "Hey, we've achieved peace in our time. We've avoided war with Germany." Winston Churchill said. He said, basically, we, Great Britain and France, had to choose between war and dishonor. We chose dishonor, and now we'll get war, right? In other words, you know, you, you should have stood up to me and, and said, you're not taking this place. Instead, you gave other countries up. And now, you're still going to have to fight him, right? He's still going to be coming in, right? And so, Chamberlain has got his head in his hand, and he believes that Hitler's going to follow his, his word. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't last because, you know, by October, Hitler, you know, was only supposed to take Sudetenland. Well, October, he took over all of Czechoslovakia. And they knew he was, they, they you know, Churchill knew he was going to get it all. Now, okay, um, the next thing that's going to happen, we're going to attack the northern United States again. Okay, and, and now, Late 1938, um, Hitler decides to 
no activity in him. But he but has a, a weekend long rampage against his ministry, avoids all his Jewish businesses, churches, the synagogues, everything. All right. He really goes after his ministry. It's called Christmas. Christmas means night of broken glass. All right. Because every Jewish business and church in Germany is destroyed because of this. All right. And, and this is the beginning of the end of the Jews. We're picking up Jesse's complaint. First, he just makes war for the Now, here's 1939, the last year during the war. Right? The Nazis. So, so Hitler knows he's going to invade Poland. He doesn't want to spare trade unionism in the war. So he sent out the non aggressive officers back when we're talking about Stalin and Hitler. Right? And this non aggressive um, basically, they both agree um, that they're not going to um, go to war with each other over Poland. Right? So basically, Hitler says, "Hey, I'm going to invade Poland. You take the eastern half, we'll take the western half. Cool." Okay. So they secretly agreed to divide Poland. Let's do this in August of 1939. And then, about this time, Great Britain has spies, and they know what Hitler's getting ready to do. So Great Britain sends a treaty with Poland and says, hey, except we're not sure when it comes to Hitler. Well, that kind of scares Hitler. And so um, September 1st, 1939, the Nazis invade Poland. And they invade Poland. Here we have the start of the war. That's going to be, you know, the end of World War II gets the end of World War One is the last war. Right? Because it's just going to devastate the whole front of Europe. Asia everywhere. All right. Now, so who else is, you know, declaring war on Hitler when he invades Poland? Great Britain, France, Australia, which is a British colony, which is the former British colony, New Zealand, former British colony. They're all going to declare war on Hitler. All right. And so here we go. Now, in 1939, the Soviets, they were buddies with Hitler. They invade Poland. In the east to take the east, right? But that's going to backfire on the Soviets because Hitler's going to come up and then he's going to come up with the So here we go, off on June 14th. Right? So everybody wanted to avoid at all costs the 1919 after the next World War One event, and then 1939, 20 years later, we got the Nazis. All right? So now, again, some of the key things that we're going to read about over the next few days. We're going to read about the Nuremberg um, Retrial. We're going to read about the Berlin Riots. So we, I don't know if we're going to for sure read about the Kristallnacht. We're going to sure read about the Retrial. I don't know if we'll read. I've got an article about um, the um, Hoffman and the Retrial. Oh, geez, we have by too much. But anyway, that's, that's what our week looks like. By the end of this week, um, we'll have really hit the main events, and, and we should be ready to test. I don't know. I'll test you next week, Monday, but then maybe give you a quiz. I don't know. But uh, anyway, that's my story on what Hitler did from the time he got caught until when he was executed. So all I got for you. Have a great day. Once again, you're gonna you're gonna fill in the blank. You're going to type them in on that form that uh, that Google Doc that I have. Right. All right. You'll, you'll fill in those in. All right. And you'll submit them. All right. So that's all I got for you. Hope you have a great day.